you'll remove me from from this pulpit and it'll be you that's speaking the word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the most spectacular productions Pastor Barry and I saw was on our recent family vacation to Branson, Missouri in April. We went to the Sights and Sounds Theater and watched the Life of Jesus production. I have never seen such attention to detail given to the set design and the portrayal of the miracles of Jesus. The walking on the water scene was so realistic and inspirational. The set would move up and down, the water would move, the boat would go up and down, it just looked amazing. Many times we think of Jesus as being divine and beyond our reach. But today, I will show the human side of many of these accounts so we can identify with Jesus as our human Savior. As we were, Jesus was also born to the world human. None of us had a choice being born into this sinful world, but Jesus did. It was decided before the formation of our planet. We are going to concentrate a lot on Isaiah 53 because you can really see Christ's humanity and plan for humanity at Calvary. Please turn with me there now, and we're going to start with verse 2. And that's Isaiah 53, verse 2. And that's right before Jeremiah. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Christ grew to manhood physically, mentally, and spiritually in harmony with the natural laws of human development. The dry ground in that verse is referring to how a plant that grows in dry ground appears stunted or unattractive. The Jewish leaders found Jesus' character unappealing. Jesus was judged by them for hanging around sinners and harlots. The Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples in Mark 2.16, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Jesus responds in verse 17, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. The Jewish leaders were blind to their own sins and good at pointing fingers at others they saw as lower than themselves. They were also too caught up in their rituals, selfish ambitions, and were expecting a king and military leader like King David. Let's continue in verse 3 and I, of Isaiah 53, and I guess I closed my Bible. <laughs> Let me go back there. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did not we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Most of you have faced some form of rejection, sorrow, grief, or envy. Yet a lot of times when we face these trials, we think that no one understands. Jesus surely understands. Jesus was tempted in every way possible. Never once did he give in. Just as Jesus put out his hand for Peter to grab when he sunk on the Sea of Galilee, he is reaching out to help us. Jesus was also rejected and denied by his disciples he loved so much. Pastor Barry and I did a prayer walk and asked a lady if she wanted to pray with us. She made excuses and rejected our proposition. When we were rejected when doing the work of God, they are also rejecting our Savior. It is hard not to take it personally, but we moved on. We decided to pray for her even though we did not pray out loud with her. Let's continue on in Isaiah 53 with verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. 
the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The fact is that Jesus suffered for us and not for himself. He suffered in our place. He experienced the pain, humiliation, and abuse that we should have experienced. Because of the choice to sin that Adam and Eve made in the Garden of Eden, we should have experienced eternal suffering. Jesus, our Savior, took it all upon himself. He did not want to experience eternal separation from us. The Pharisees made it appear that the sufferings of Jesus were punishment inflicted upon him by a vengeful God because he was a sinner. But we know this is a, a deception of Satan, and Jesus never once sinned. In John 1, 14, it says, And the Word uh, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. By doing this, he could associate with the sinful, sorrowing sons and daughters of Adam. According to a sermon by Lewis Walton, the Pharisees were breaking their own laws to get Jesus killed. Shortly before Jesus was arrested, the Jewish leaders met at night to discuss in secret, which is also against their own laws. Similarly, there was a woman who was dragged to Jesus for committing adultery. The man involved should have been facing punishment as well. Jesus' humiliation was necessary to bring us peace with God. If you could, please turn with me to Romans 5.1. right after Acts. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to follow Christ's example. As it says in 1 Peter 2, 21, 22, and 24, Christ suffered for you, leaving you a model for you to follow his steps closely. He committed no sin, nor was deception found in his mouth. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the stake in order that we might be done with sins and live in righteousness, and by his stripes you were healed. If we follow in Jesus' footsteps, we not only will be saved, but we will be free from worry, restless minds, sin, and eternal separation from our Savior. This is not to say that we will not be tempted by Satan, but with Christ we can overcome anything Satan throws our way. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. After the Last Supper, Jesus had, had, his, had with his disciples, um, sorry, he was with his disciples, <laughs> they traveled over to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was desperate to be near his Father in heaven. Jesus also needed the support of his disciples. In the Jesus production we saw, the garden scene was a hard scene to watch seeing what Jesus had experienced. Jesus threw himself on a rock and in tears spoke to his father. Meanwhile, he had asked his disciples to stay awake and pray with them, saying to them in Mark 14, 34 to 35, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. In the play, discouraging voices were tormenting Jesus during the garden scene. I have never heard this garden scene presented that way before. Satan did not want Jesus to die for us. This would mean Satan failed. Yet today, Satan still fights to bring as many of God's people as he can to destruction. There's a story of a Romanian pastor named Richard Warmbrand, who was the youngest of four boys. He married Sabina Oyster in 1936. He had a son named Michael together. Richard was living in Romania at a time when it had been taken over by communist Russia. Russia declared that atheism was the official religion. 
Like many countries that are communist, leaders tried to control every aspect of their people's lives. Religion was at the top of that list. When the government attempted to control the churches, Pastor Warmbrand immediately began an underground ministry to his people. They would meet in homes for church and Bible study. Richard also risked his life preaching to Russian communist soldiers. Although Richard worked as a professor in the only Lutheran seminary of Romania, he also worked with Christians of many other denominations. Richard stood up and denounced government control of the churches. He was then arrested after this on February 29, 1948. Richard was taken to prison where he was told they were not like the Nazis who would kill their prisoners. They wanted the prisoners to give names of different church members. If the prisoners refused to help, they were severely tortured. Prisoners were also punished for praying. Richard was in solitary confinement for three years. He was all by himself in a, in a cell for that. While in prison, his wife was arrested and sent to a labor camp. Eventually, Richard contracted tuberculosis and was transferred to another facility where he was put in room four. The unique thing about room four is no one had come out of that room alive before. Medicine was not allowed. A doctor who was a Christian secretly working for the communists gave Richard medicine that saved his life. After being in prison for 14 years, Richard was released. He would never walk the same way again because of the beating his feet endured. Finally, he was reunited with his wife, who didn't know for sure if she would ever see him alive again. Richard helped with the conversion of many people to Christ, and he later died at the age of 91 in 2001. If Christ had not strengthened Richard, there is no way he would have survived as a sane human being. I know for me, I, I probably wouldn't be able to survive a day in a situation like that. Jesus willingly came down to our world to become human and to endure all the struggles we face and more. Picking back up in Isaiah 53 with verse 6, and I guess we've got to turn back there. <laughs> all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out, I mean, he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knew of the trials his disciples would face when he was taken from them. Asking his disciples to pray wasn't necessarily for his own benefit, but to give them strength for what they would face. They would face doubt, fear, and despair. They would need the assurance of faith to know they would see Jesus again. They were going to be separated from their shepherd for a time. As soon as the Jewish leaders, Judas, and soldiers came to take Jesus, the disciples scattered, just as Isaiah said the sheep have gone astray. This is also speaking about how we do our own things sometimes and wander away from Jesus. But praise the Lord for the assurance Jesus gives us in Matthew 18, starting in verse 11. And we'll go ahead and turn there. That's Matthew 18, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye? If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine, and go into the mountains, and seek it that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Isn't that so comforting? To know that our Savior would search for us, leave those who are secure in their relationship with God to come find us, accept us how we are, and carry us tenderly back home. We are going to finish out Isaiah 53. 
As you can see, there are multiple sermons that could be preached on a single chapter of Isaiah. We'll pick up in verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich and his dead, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and, so, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgression, transgressors. Our Savior was given a murderer's death, and given a burial of a sinner, not a saint. Jesus was placed in the tomb of a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. It may be confusing in verse 10 how it says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. The explanation for that is the Lord was not delighted that his servant, the Messiah, would suffer, but rather in view of the eternal welfare of men and the security of the universe, it was the best for him to suffer. It pleased the Lord in the sense that it was the will of the Lord. Only thus could the plan of salvation succeed. The sufferings of Christ were part of the eternal plan. Just as Richard did not give up his faith in the face of tri tribulation and torture, our Savior Jesus Christ did not give up his faith in his Father when he endured one of the most horrendous ways to die. Jesus did it because he loves us that much. As our scripture reading says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the power of Christ that all of us have access to by surrendering our lives to Jesus. This is the power of the cross. Amen. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to the cross of wood. This the power of the cross, Christ became.